continue our lessons this morning from the Lord's Word, and we're going to read from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 5 to gain a little better understanding of what the Lord is intending to mean by the vineyard that was spoken of when he was telling this parable. So Isaiah chapter 5 is kind of like a song or spoken as a song to uh, the people of Israel from the Lord. It says, Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes. But it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please t let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned, and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. Woe to those who join house to house. They add field to field till there is no place where they may dwell alone in the midst of the land. In my hearing, the Lord of hosts said, Truly, many houses shall be desolate, great and beautiful ones without inhabitant. For ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and an omer of seed shall yield one ephah. We also read from the heavenly doctrine for the new church. And this is speaking about... When, when the word talks about completely or utterly destroying something, uh, speaking about what the Lord said he would do to this vineyard, that he will come and destroy it. Speaking about those words, it says that to utterly destroy them means that evils, and, evils must be completely removed. This is clear from the meaning of destroying when it has reference to evils and falsities meant by the nations of the land of Canaan and their, and their gods as removing. The reason why destroying means removing is that those who are governed by goodness and truth never destroy those ruled by evil and falsity, but merely move them away. This they do because good, not evil, governs their actions, and good comes from the Lord who never destroys anyone. However, those ruled by evil and consequently by falsity try to destroy, and so far as they can, they do destroy those governed by good. This they do because evil rules their actions. But since when they try to do so, they make their attack on good, which comes from the Lord, thus on what is of God, they destroy themselves." That is, they hurl themselves into damnation and into hell. This is the law of order. And now also from Arcana Celestia 1069, talking about the meaning of a vineyard and the vine. Vineyards, in the Lord's word, mean spiritual churches. Since the vine means the spiritual church, and the chief thing of the spiritual church is charity which it, within which the Lord is present, by means of which he joins himself to people, and by means of which he alone works everything good. 
The Lord therefore compares himself to the vine and describes the member of the church, that is, describes the spiritual church in the following way, that I am the vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away, but every one that does bear fruit he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. And the passage continues. So here end our lessons. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And now to the one only God, Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so we are doing this series. It's a very long series on the Gospel of Mark because we're going through kind of chapter by chapter, and in Easter we kind of jumped ahead to chapter 16 to read the Easter story in Mark, and we read in chapter 11, which is the Palm Sunday story over the past two weeks, so we're catching ourselves back up just after Palm Sunday. Chapter 11 begins with the triumphal entry of the Lord riding the donkey with the crowds cheering him on and, and saying, Hosanna to the highest, and, uh, and the Lord comes into Jerusalem and you remember when we talked about this, we went, so the Lord's acting the part of an historical king in Israel. That's what they do. He is showing that, part, that he is king. But we looked at this and we went, but he never finishes that ritual. And in a way that makes us go, well, so he's saying he is a king in one level, but not in the natural way that we think of kings. And then when we look forward to Pontius Pilate, when he asks him, are you a king then? The Lord says, yeah, you're answering correctly. But my kingdom is not of this world. It seems to me that the Gospel of Mark is constantly trying to say, there's this natural thing that you're all thinking of when you read my word. This natural life is what you're thinking about. And what I'm trying to do is to say, yep, there are natural things that are important, but really I'm talking about something higher. That's what a lot of, of, of the Gospel of Mark is about. And chapter 12 is filled with this. It's filled with the question marks that I think we have as individuals who live in the natural world, who are focused here in this natural world, but hope and believe that there is something beyond. We might doubt it. That's going to come up in our story today. We might doubt it, but there is this hope that there's something more. And we don't quite understand it. So most of when we read, we're going, well, how does this fix my life? And, and when we think about life, we're thinking about natural life. Our finances might be something about that, our relationships, our jobs, things like that. Um, if the Lord isn't taking care of my natural necessities, does that mean that the Lord isn't caring for me? And of course, the, the answer is no. I think any Christian can answer that and say, no, that's not really what it's about. And yet, we still get, we cling to this idea that the Lord is going to fix our natural lives. When our natural lives to the Lord are only, I guess the things that happen in it are only as important as how they affect our eternal life. So, if the Lord wants you to go to heaven, and he knows that if you were rich in this world, that that wouldn't happen. It would be a terrible idea for the Lord to then give you lots of wealth, knowing that's going to send you to hell. That you're going to get too obsessed with your wealth and, and greedy, and that's going to bring you in. So the Lord would actually know that. And he'd go, well, it stinks that this person might need to live in poverty to understand what money is all about, what wealth is all about, and that it's really about usefulness and service not about the money. It stinks for somebody to be, to be in poverty. The Lord doesn't want somebody to be in poverty. He tells us to, you know, even on the natural level, to help people who are poor. The poor and needy are really, really big, important ideas. But if whatever natural circumstance is going to cause a negative eternal circumstance, the Lord's going to avoid it. Or perhaps somebody could for some reason, I'm not sure exactly how this would work, but let's say maybe somebody needed to have lots of money to go through the challenges they needed to face in order to understand the same exact thing. 
that money is not about wealth and, and eminence in this world, that it's actually about service. Same idea. The Lord would know that, you know, that person needs to experience having wealth in order to understand the same concept. So we could have two very different natural circumstances, a rich person and a poor person next to each other, that the Lord is going, this is going to help this person go to heaven, and this is going to help that person go to heaven, and they're the exact opposite circumstances. Because the Lord's saying it's not about these circumstances except to the extent that they have to do with eternal ones. So the Lord tells this story of the vineyard, and the people know he's talking about them, which is a strange thing in, in the Lord's word for the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees to actually know what the Lord kind of means by something. Most of the time they're left well in the dust. This time it says, and they knew he was talking about them. He tells them the story of this landowner, plants a vineyard, and it's exactly the same as that story in Isaiah, isn't it? He builds this hedge around it, and he puts the vat for the, the wine press. It's that beautiful vineyard that the Lord prepared. And he gave it to these people, to, he leases it to the vine dressers, and they decide that they're not going to divvy up anything. When the Lord comes and says, hey, you know that life I've been leading you to live? Um, now's the time for you to live that way so that it can help this other person. When the Lord calls on us to live in a certain way, that's like the Lord coming back to the vineyard and asking for its produce. So we learn lessons in life from the Lord's word, from church, from uh, whatever we're doing. And hopefully, uh, when, when we're in a circumstance where we can help and we've been given the opportunity, the truth to do it, that we're not going to go, and I don't want to. Or... I'm too scared, or maybe I don't know enough. This is one of the things that is kind of nerve-wracking about trying to live spiritual principles. And sometimes we feel like I have to know it all before I start acting or before I start living that way. We go, I don't quite know if I got it right, so I'm just going to keep living back here in this version of life. The Lord says pretty much every time we, are, you know, we learn something, let's apply it. Apply that truth, and we'll find out if it's going to work or not. All right, so this vineyard, we said, is representative of the church, the spiritual church. And uh, the spiritual church is a really specific thing. It's not talking about specific denominations or church buildings or this group of people. It could be talking about me or you or everybody individually. But the church or the spiritual church in general, the Lord describes as one that is receptive of spiritual ideas, meaning truths from the Lord, that are intended for the sake of loving the neighbor. That's the spiritual church is people who receive from the Lord in order to care for the neighbor, which is different from the celestial church who kind of serve the neighbor because it loves the Lord. The purpose is different. The Lord is the celestial, uh, the, the focus of the celestial, whereas other people are the focus of the spiritual church. So we're talking about that. Now, how do we know that a vineyard means a spiritual church? He's just making that stuff up. Well, we can actually go, no, the Lord shows us this. All churches in the Lord's word are represented by gardens. The garden of Jehovah, the garden that Adam and Eve were planted or placed in to tend this garden, that is the celestial church. It is the church that the Lord established. Now, after Adam and Eve fall away, they're kicked out of the garden, and all of this other stuff happens. The flood happens, and Noah gets out of the flood, finally comes out of the ark. He then he plants a vineyard. It's a specific kind of garden. It's a garden that grows grapes. It's a specific kind. And, and those grapes, we might go, oh, that's like the wine, the Lord's blood. It all adds up as to that's the source of information. The Lord gives the truth represented by the wine. So the vineyard represents that. It represents that truth that, that people who are of the spiritual truth, meaning they are trying to love their neighbor and learn how to do so, that is the spiritual church. So this vineyard shows the Lord can teach us those things. The Lord can teach us how to love our neighbor. 
He does so all the time in his word, every single sentence. And we do. We, I bet you every single one in here could write for hours and hours and hours about how they can love their neighbor and keep it absolutely true. You can avoid some of the hard subjects, but you could just write for days on that because you have that information in your head. Don't you? Don't we have information on how do I care for other people in the way that the Lord wants me to? We know what that is. So this parable about the Lord's vineyard, think about it, how they say they knew Jesus was talking about them. Doesn't that make us, like we don't like being the bad guys in the Bible, but shouldn't that make us think for a second, maybe he's talking to me too? That by them saying, oh, he's talking about us, that we should go, maybe he's talking about me. What about all those ideas that we have about caring for our neighbor that we don't act on? We know it's the right way to live, and yet we don't. Sometimes that happens because we feel too busy. Sometimes that happens because we're too stuck in our own mindset of life and how we're living, and, and we just ignore it. But we know. And think about all of these servants coming that the Lord is sending or the master is sending to the vineyard and, and saying, hey, can I have some of that produce? Think about all of the opportunities that are being passed by in our lives for serving our neighbor, that we know how to, it's just that we're not. That's sending them away. Now, it gets worse when we start beating them up, stoning them, killing them. If we're just doing it out of ignorance, that's one thing. But I'm sorry, I'm telling you that you know, and so now we're not doing it out of ignorance. The Lord asks us to take what he gives us. It's not just for me to go to heaven. This is one of the hardest things, I think, for us to get about church and about religion. The Lord doesn't provide the church just so I can get to heaven. That's not the relationship that's just me, between me and him or between you and him. There is that. But the life that is heavenly isn't just that. It's about the flow from the Lord through us to others. We're told in the writings for the new church that the Lord cannot benefit people directly from himself because he has bequeathed humanity true freedom, or at least the full appearance. He says is he cannot bequeath, uh, or sorry, cannot uh, benefit people to whom he's bequeathed this kind of freedom. And so he does it indirectly through other people. That's powerful. The Lord doesn't benefit people directly. He does it indirectly through other people. There's a lot of theology behind that concept that we're, we're, we'll, we can talk about other times. Like, well, why doesn't the Lord benefit people directly? But we're going to leave that behind. Just say, no, that is a truth. The Lord doesn't do it because he doesn't want to interfere with our sense of freedom. If the Lord was constantly going, oh, Landon needs $5, here's $5, and he walks over and actually, this is the Lord giving it to me. That gives Landon very little ability to deny the existence of God and therefore accept God in full freedom because he has the capability of denying it. So he does it individual or uh, vicariously through other people. That means that we are necessary in that system. That when we are the vine dressers that, that have this land leased to us, these ideas given to us that are growing and fruiting in our minds of how do I make things better? How does it, do I make the, the world a better place? We have these grand aspirations. Hopefully we can actually apply them. That's really the simple version of this story. Now, what I'd love to do is to ask you to then take that concept of what the vineyard is and realize, again, that the Lord's trying to raise our minds out of what's just natural into something spiritual and then look at all of the stories that follow. Because each one is kind of like the way that we would go, yeah, but... There's a whole bunch of yeah buts in this chapter. So they know the Lord is speaking to them. And then it goes on and they're like, yeah, but. 
You know, there's this guy who married this woman, and then he died before they had any children. And so the brother took the wife, and then he died, no children. And then that brother, the next brother, and seven of them get married, and none of them end up having children. So who is married in heaven? Have we ever done this with theology? Like, maybe it's somebody else's theology. And we'll go, okay, what's the thing that I can automatically use to disprove any of the validity, the, the valid things that are there? Okay, let's go to the weird extreme example. Okay, let's, let's try, okay, the Lord says there's marriage and that it's one man and one woman. And wait, but what if there's seven? God, can I ignore these other things because there's a problem here? And we'll, we'll try to find problems. That's what is coming up in the rest of this chapter is the Pharisees, the Sadducees, demonstrating that part of ourselves that doesn't want to fully live into the life of the church, that doesn't fully want to take the truths that the Lord gives them to care for other people and find reasons why they don't have to. Yeah, but let's, what about this circumstance, God? So you have the one of the marriage, right? That, that was all under the pretense of whether you know, there's this afterlife or not. Because the Sadducees don't believe in a, in a resurrection. Those were the ones that were asking the question. So it's obvious that this is true hypocrisy that they're, they're, they're demonstrating. What's really coming out of this chapter is the Lord is going, all those yeah, but questions, you're just trying to get out of it. The Lord tells them, basically, you're just, you're just messing with me. Like, this has nothing to do with what you're actually wanting to know. And so the Lord does what he should. It's like, let's go back to the basics. Let's not worry about talking about how many husbands or wives are going to... That, that's something we, we don't need to talk about that. He goes, the two most important things. First of all, he says... Um, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. So all those ideas that you're rejecting, that's what you need to build your life on. And then when they push him even farther, he says, yeah, then you need to go back to the very first things. How do you love the Lord? How do you love your neighbor? That's what this chapter ends up with. All those other questions, ask those first. How do I love my Lord? How do I love my neighbor? really quite a simple system that the Lord has designed for us. Love the Lord. Love the neighbor. We're the ones that come up with all the weird, crazy questions. And the only reason why we want the answers is so we can have excuses not to do what the Lord teaches. So the question is, is are we rejecting that stone? Because that's what we need to build our life on. The Lord said, upon this rock, not upon Peter, but upon the faith in God, in the concept of loving him and loving our neighbor, that is what he will build his church upon. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Amen. Please rise. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.